Okay, can I ask you to take your seats, please, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you very much. We're just going to get started on this next breakout session. Effectively, I'll allow him to introduce himself, um, but uh, our next speaker is Don Smith, Vice President at SecureWorks. We know the fact that nothing stands still, everything changes, and the threat landscape particularly evolves. So, Don, over to you. Thank you very much, Mark. Thanks. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Well, it looks like an odd. Okay, so SecureWorks and numbers, 1,400 incident response engagements a year, 4,500 corporate networks that we protect. Uh, four and a half trillion security events processed a week and 30 petabytes of data in our data lake that my team can do lovely way back searches on when new badness is discovered. Who am I? I guess I'm a curmudgeonly old Scotsman. I've been doing this since a cyber attack at Heriot-Watt University back in 1991. Um, I've chaired the Cyber Industry Group at the National Crime Agency for the last seven years. I'm a member of the Cabinet Office National Cyber Advisory Board and I guess more importantly, um, working at SecureWorks, CIR company since day one on the scheme um, and leading the, the threat research team globally for SecureWorks. Years ago, I used to put up this picture of Camas Darach Beach, you know. Um, we had Fulton Mackay in Local Hero being asked, what's the most interesting thing that turns up on the beach? And he says, something interesting turns up every day. So I don't know if everyone's following Twitter this morning. Uh, my team has been alive since about... Um, half past six last night, um, it's still ongoing. The North Korean attribution is through the malware um, that was dropped by the Trojanized installer. Um, so I, I had never heard of 3CX, I've no idea how widespread this is, whether my afternoon is going to be ruined by it or not. Um, but uh, if you use it, do a bit of Googling this morning, um, or this afternoon. Uh, so, bad guys, um, since I've been doing this for the last 30 years, it's been characterized by an evolution of threat actors. Um, started off with explorers, uh, people who just were having a wee look around, very much characterized by Cliff Stoll and the Cuckoo's Egg. Then moved to graffiti artists, those people who are kind of tagging themselves with worms like I love you. And then, you know, 2005, 2006, Russian criminals realized they could monetize a network intrusion. Since then, we've seen hacktivists come and go, and come and go, I guess most recently with Killnet and of course, hostile state actors and spooks. So what's a threat? Threat is a combination of uh, intent, uh, capability, and opportunity. So the desire to do something, the means with which you can do it, and the opportunity that presents itself that allows you to carry out that. And the principal opportunities that we see are stealing money, uh, stealing ideas or data, temporary disruption, and somewhat more permanent disruption. And for the bulk of this deck, I'm gonna talk about criminal money making. Why? Because criminal money making is essentially untargeted, despite fear, uncertainty, and doubt you might get from other people. So ransomware, how did we get here? In 2015, SecureWorks incident responders responded to something like 10 or 12 incidents of cryptographic ransomware being deployed across networks uh, in local authorities in the United States. Um, it did turn out in the end that um, that was an Iranian mob. They've since been indicted by the FBI. But that was the first case of moving from single host ransomware to kind of the serious incidents like Colonial Pipeline or Eurofins. Um, so that evolution uh, is actually the evolution of uh, not uh, spotty kids in hoodies. Um, that's the evolution of organized criminal gangs, gangs looking to maximize the return on investment on a network intrusion. So a single host compromise of a banking trojan a decade ago netted you some funds, but not a lot. And the victim wasn't the enterprise, it was the person. Then there was single host um, encryption stuff like CryptoLocker, uh, which was taken down in the Game of Zeus takedown, which we participated in in the FBI back in 2014 or something. Um, uh, and then of course, post intrusion ransomware, let's knock out an entire organization. That will force them to come up with some, uh, some goods. Then they realized they, were, they had the outlay of performing um, the ransomware, but no return because people might have had good backups or, or, or whatever. And there came the multiple extortion routes with, with name and shame. So ransomware numbers. Um, in 2022, SecureWorks Incident Response Team responded to 53 uh, post-intrusion ransomware incidents. In the last five years, we've responded to 332 incidents of that nature. 
Uh, the largest ransom payment I've personally seen being paid is 13 and a half million. That's not from Twitter, that's something I've seen. Um, ransomware's in numbers. 2022 leak site data. So like most big security companies, we scrape all leak sites, um, we stick them in an elastic index, and we also pop them into teams so any of our consultants or uh, researchers can just see what's popping up on the leak site on a constant basis. So you can get a feeling from the leak site as to the shape of ransomware. Um, and about 3,000 victims listed on leak sites um, uh, last year. And that figure agrees with, for those who know him, Stevie Wilson at the CDA it agrees with Andy Ald at PwC. We all get together at these national crime agency meetings. So we're all scraping roughly the same, same leak sites. Then, of course, you have the FBI comes along and they do takedowns. So they, they disrupted Hive. Um, there were 209 victims listed on the leak site, but 1,500 um, uh, in the internal infrastructure that they got hold of which implies that 87% of victims paid because they didn't appear on the leak sites. With Avadin, there's a very similar story. 3,000 victims, 182 on the leak site, implies that 94% of victims paid. So let's split the difference and say that 90% of victims are paying, and we have 3,000 on the leak site. There's probably 30,000 victims of ransomware in 2022. The ecosystem, well, hopefully we all know and understand this with the people the OCGs operate in the ransomware ecosystem. They have their franchisees, the affiliates that are actually conducting hands on keyboard, um, the actions on objective within the networks, and initial access brokers who specialize in achieving that network intrusion in the first place. And the degree of vertical integration in these groups varies. Um, so for example, with Lockbit, who are the most prolific group from the last 18 months or so, um, and of course, relatively famous for the Royal Mail, including the infamous quote, the Royal Mail needs a new negotiator. If you go and look at the negotiation which they, they leaked, you can see that the Royal Mail negotiator tried all of the classic tricks in the book, which we would try too in our nego negotiation service. You know, we're healthcare, we don't have that much money, I need time to get the seniors involved. And I think Lockbit got fed up. But what was fascinating about this was that uh, on the forums, Lockbit denied being involved in uh, the Royal Mail attack full stop, and then they kind of admitted, oh no, we've worked out it was one of our affiliates that was responsible for this. And this and other data points has caused us to believe that the franchisees, the affiliates of Lockbit, actually have direct access to the leak site to post information on victims. So they have a very, very decentralized model, whereas Others, like Conte that I spoke about last year, were much more monolithic, much more vertically integrated. And that's why Lockbit keep coming up as hitting victims that really they really shouldn't do because they don't have direct control of their affiliates. Um, so their, highly, their model is highly devolved, uh, and as a result, they have massive scale. And you can see they've gone from a standing start to being absolutely prolific. Okay, most of us, I guess, are probably network defenders. So um, how bad is it? So the mean response time, the mean uh, dwell time between initial intrusion and the encryption event, 11 days uh, from our data from 2022. The median, four and a half days. All of you expert statisticians out there will know that if you have the, the mean out um, at 11 and the median at four and a half, that you have a long tail distribution. And of course the range is one day to, to 67 because the mean is a very bad estimator when you have large values. So the median is the best one. Four and a half days is still a relatively luxurious time to catch someone tapping hands on keyboard within your network. So the detection window is small, but it is absolutely real. What are the top three access methods? This is a slide that causes me major pain. Um, scan and exploit, so unpatched internet facing infrastructure. Replay of static credentials and commodity malware, the emotets and quack bots and ICE IDs of this world. Now, it used to be the case, pre-colonial pipeline, that commodity malware was, the, was the, the winner out of these three, possibly with about 40 to 45% of IIVs across our data set being commodity malware, with the other two on supply chain tailing uh, in the background. Since colonial pipeline, um, this has changed and has been consistently different. 
where we're now in a situation, and this is matched by other people's data too, that 50% of the ransomware events start with somebody being compromised through unpatched internet-facing infrastructure. Oh my God, I've been doing this for 30 years and people are still putting things on the internet and not patching it. 40% is credential replay. There's loads of people out there who think they have multi-factor off, but they don't have multi-factor off everywhere. There's a few vendor accesses or a few other things that they haven't covered. Do multi-factor off completely. What this is telling me is that 90% of the victims of ransomware are pretty much self-selected um, by holes in their own um, control frameworks. How are things changing? Is ransomware going away? Well, it's interesting. Sorry, this is a text-heavy slide. You guys should not read it, but of course you'll all read it and I'll speak. Um, so we are seeing a slight downturn. So in uh, 2021, we probably saw, I think, 78 ransomware incidents that our incident response teams did. 2020, it was a similar level, mid-70s, and then we're in the mid-50s um, last year. So we are seeing a, a slowdown. National certs are also seeing a slowdown. However, the leak sites are showing gentle growth, which is within statistical bounds of being flat, but gentle growth. And law enforcement is seeing gentle growth. So what can explain this apparent disparity between what people like me and Mandiant and, and CrowdStrike and others are seeing, uh, what national certs are seeing, and what the leak sites are, are, are showing, and what law enforcement is showing? Well, the actor landscape is increasingly fractured. The very large OCGs collapsed upon themselves post-colonial pipeline because you go and stop Americans putting fuel in their cars, guess what? That becomes a national security issue for the US and all sorts of three-letter agencies suddenly are super interested in ransomware. And I don't know, but I can guess that there was some pain felt by the ransomware actors post-colonial pipeline. So we had a collapse of the monolithic groups. We potentially also had post intrusion triage where it's like are you about to take down an entity that a government cares about because if you are are you going to know do that because that is going to bring the pain back back upon the actors it's bad for business to have the intelligence community ch chasing you down so if you accept that as a thesis then the next part of that is that you've got lots of mid-range enterprises who are getting biffed by ransomware and those mid-range enterprises are less likely to pay the many hundreds of dollars an hour that um, high-end uh, response companies charge. They are less likely to have relationships with national certs or intelligence agencies. So there's aperture bias in the reporting. Whereas the insurers will always insist that you get a crime number. So, that, so you, can, you can guarantee that the law enforcement statistics are probably still an underestimate, but more reliable than national certs and response companies. Add to that the fact that these days the ransomware actors are typically not encrypting a whole enterprise, they are actually just encrypting the site they land on. And that doesn't take down a whole enterprise, it doesn't stop your phones working, it doesn't stop you from making whatever widgets you make. So you end up with a single site outage which you can generally deal with, you don't need full root cause analysis and you don't necessarily have to report it to the press or the papers. So the focus for these types of incidents is very much more on recovery rather than root cause analysis. And recovery is IT skills, not expensive incident response skills. So it is a complicated landscape. I, I liken it to all the muscles and tendons in the back. All these things are moving around differently and you can't predict how it is. But I think ransomware is still as prevalent as ever, but with smaller victims and smaller ransom payments being made. Obviously, there was also the dip in activity this time last year, which was basically everything paused for about eight weeks. Um, there's always a dip kind of about this time of the year because of various Russian Orthodox holidays I don't understand. Um, but uh, the other bit there is if you look at F historical FBI indictments, very often they're indicting Ukrainians as often as they're indicting Russians. And if you're participating in ransomware uh, actions and suddenly you're moving your family around because uh, you fear for their lives, or you've been called up to the front to fight for your country, then that obviously created a, a massive destabilization in their ability to execute. It's also got even more complicated. So um, Bronze Starlight is a Chinese group uh, that does ransomware operations. And it is believed that the, the Chinese government will tolerate subcontractors who work for them 
on traditional APT, hostile state actor attacks, conducting ransomware attacks as homers. I don't know why they would do that, because it could bring further pain on them. But uh, we've seen a significant number of um, engagements where it's actually a Chinese ransomware crew rather than a Russian ransomware crew. I think, in fact, we have an updated Intel product on Bronze Starlight that's gone to customers this week that we, we might publish. That's a, quite an old blog post. And then it started with Iranians, and it continues with Iranians, um, where we've reported on a group called Cobalt Mirage. And these guys uh, conducted, I think we had nine different incident response engagements with them last year. Um, you can see our description on the threat profiles. We've got a Rosetta Stone on our website, if any of you are interested in trying to work out what our daft names are for things. Um, definitely, though, a ransomware crew. In, in two of the incidents, the bad guys dropped files onto um, their kind of hot box in the infrastructure of the victim. And some of those had metadata in them which pointed uh, directly at an individual and a company um, in Iran. So we thought, this is cool. Got, I was in DC, and I was having dinner with Raphael Sata from Reuters, and I said, do you want to talk about this? And he's like, hell yeah. Um, but then he got overexcited about Indian hackers for hire. So we had this kind of knocking around saying, we're going to go public with the fact that we can attribute to a person. Is that a good idea? Is it a bad idea? We're raising stakes. Anyway, we decided to do it. Um, and then we asked our PR team when they wanted to go live. And they picked an arbitrary Wednesday and they picked an arbitrary time. So they picked 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on an arbitrary Wednesday. And we were like, cool, we'll do that. So we did that. And then at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on that arbitrary Wednesday, the US Department of Justice and the FBI indicted the people that we named in our blog post two hours earlier, which was a total coincidence. And to this day, the lady in our PR team who said that let's publish it on this day at this time, she's like, you somehow tricked me. You used, used some kind of mind thing on me, Don. I'm like, look, we had absolutely nothing to do with this. We had no clue they were doing it. It was just a complete coincidence. Okay, right, botnets. Um, no, not so much the uh, flavor of the month, but anyway. Um, Microsoft uh, clearly making changes to help by stopping code coming from the internet zone being executed. So what happens if you're a professional organized criminal gang and you cannot use macros in the way you used to? Oh, that's okay, you just send OneNote documents around. I'm getting tired of my team writing threat intelligence product about different things getting dropped by OneNote, but it's absolutely constant. Please tell your people, be, be aware, don't click on any OneNote links. Um, they're also trying to disrupt, disrupt researchers. So um, this, again, is a piece of Intel product from when's the date on that, October. Um, so we saw Quackbot taking screenshots of the timestamp on the computer as it was detonating. And it would take screenshots periodically um, and then post them back. Obviously, most automated sandboxes, you'll start a VM, you won't care about the time. Suddenly, you have to care about the time being the real time. Then also complicated um, algorithms with um, Emotet for kind of signing things. And then finally, which is somewhat more recent, um, Emotet restarted spamming about two or three weeks ago. Um, and the attachments are enormous. The zip files aren't big. But um, the maldoc has been padded with zero bytes, so it compresses really easily. But when you uncompress it, as you can see here, this sample, Graham is saying, is 570 megabytes. And almost every sandbox or mobile detonation thing will throw away anything that's more than about 20 or 30 meg, because that's just going to chew up resources. So definitely trying to stymie us. Um, as I said, Emotet recommends spamming. We have uh, botnet emulators. Uh, we're a little Python script, so we pretend to be the malware. We participate in the botnet. We then will get things like um, the protobuf files with the hijack threads that say, you know, please resend this out. Um, so this is an example of hijack thread. You probably can't read it, but it doesn't even say click on the attachment. It, it literally is just a hijacked email thread with an attachment added to it. This one is, is slightly better because it says, Please find the below attachment for your reference. This stuff is working for them. Everyone's banging on about chat GPT. If crap like this works, why bother <laughs> with chat GPT? And of course, in SecureWorks, like I say, we scrape all this stuff, we automatically feed it through, and you know, yada, yada, yada. That would be my 20 second product pitch. Um, <laughs> business email compromise. Oh, look at the growth 40 to 121 last year and projecting a little more than that 
uh, in the coming year. Um, this is a huge problem. According to IC3 at the FBI, their new report isn't out yet, but that one shows it's a huge problem. At the NCA in December, we had a bunch of people around the room, different industries, at, at the cyber industry group. There were three organizations at the table, there's maybe 20 people at the table, there were three organizations with first-hand experience of business email compromise, and if I added up the amounts that were extorted in those three incidents, it was $21 million in one meeting. People who had, not like, hey, I heard about it from a man in the pub, but this happened to me. Um, so how does it manifest itself? Um, obviously, you will get a link. It might point to OneDrive. It might look very, very uh, legitimate. In fact, the bad guys have found a way of proxying stuff through OneDrive. Then you go to something which, if you could read, that URL is not a legitimate URL. And then they get in, and they've got the email forwarding rules. And before you know it, a supplier is getting um, invoice redirection nonsense. Now, when I was preparing for this, um, uh, well, actually, I did this slide for Gartner in Dubai a few weeks ago. I asked to go through our um, incident response reports for BEC, and I discovered actually that we were we were not being careful enough in how we were classifying what I called BEC because business email compromise literally is compromise of email. But I think everyone in this room would probably say, "Don, it's invoice re redirection fraud." Um, and what I found was that we had a significant amount of the incidents where pure worms that were redirecting to credential capture websites, but only 40% was invoice redirection fraud. And you can differentiate that really easily because of the difference in the, the mail filtering rules that are set up. You know, super big hint, if you aren't monitoring people getting mail outlook forwarding rules set up, do, because that's how you find this stuff. Um, but anyway, it's interesting, just a focus on credential capture. And info stealers, obviously malware that steals credentials, steals your entire footprint from a browser, steals cookies, all the rest of that. Why is no one selling logs anymore on one of the generic forums? I'm not sure which one this was, raid forums or whatever. Because they are now on super dedicated forums. On the 23rd of February, Russian market was offering over 5.3 million logs for sale. A log is their language for everything they've collected from an info stealer when it executed in your profile in Windows. So anything cached in your browser, credit cards, cookies, stored passwords, the lot. One of that cluster is one log. So all of these info stealers, um, Raccoon, Vider, Redline, Azeroth, some of them are new, some are old, are out there hoovering this stuff up and there's an active market in selling it. We also have, obviously, the in initial access brokers playing in this game. And we've seen some really interesting stuff there where this is an initial access broker that has worked out that they are selling access to a home computer that someone is using to log into um, the corporate network of a global drinks manufacturer. Um, in the past, they wouldn't have had that level of triage or detail. So they were selling it for an elevated price. Um, uh, actually, not an elevated price, but I'll come to that. Um, because they knew that this was giving access to a corporate entity, not just, not just a home desktop. Being generally good guys, we reached out to this global drinks manufacturer and told them uh, about this so they could kind of track it down. The key thing here is it was auctioned. And there was a move post-colonial pipeline from the sale of creds towards auction rather than um, fixed price sale. So you, you, auctions are used when something is is rare or unusual and you've no idea where the price will land in the market. Or auctions are used when you know it's rare and you know people are gonna be competing for it. And in the case of selling credentials that get access to computers, that market has been in existence for a long time. So the level is set. But what happened post-colonial pipeline is that suddenly people didn't, were, were screaming to buy this stuff and a whole lot of these sites moved to auction rather than fixed, fixed price sale. So what does that all mean for the ransomware ecosystem? So let's rewind back. You have the big OCGs who, who in many ways owned the botnets, the emotets, the trick bots, um, the quack bots of this world. They suddenly collapse in on themselves, become much more vertically integrated, have much less scale after Colonial Pipeline because they don't want the embarrassment or the hassle of the NSA or others going after them. That leaves all of these affiliates, these franchisees floating around looking for a new place to work. They can't buy into access to the botnets. 
So they need to do one of two things. They need to just scan the internet for vulnerabilities or they need to buy credentials. So is the rise of InfoStealers, the move to auctioning on the InfoStealer and credential capture websites, the change to these email worms that are propagating around to steal credentials, is all that driven by an increase of demand by the shrapnel of the low end of the ransomware landscape? Okay, that was e-crime. This is nation state. Hostile state actors. Multiple groups are taking a lead from e-crime with in-country access tiers so that their C2 comms are not traversing you know, subsea cables where people might be able to look at it more carefully. They're also doing scan and exploit. We're seeing a huge number of nation state incidents where it is um, security infrastructure, VPN concentrators, or whatever that is compromised. I think everybody knows that most people have an EDR agent now and they're looking at what happens with process launches and all the rest of that kind of good stuff. It's actually easier for them to hide in the places where in the past it was harder for them to hide because these edge devices are not as well instrumented as they have been or could be. When what's new isn't new, everyone has a partial aperture. I know I have a partial aperture. I spend half my life trying to validate if what my team knows is complete or incomplete. Rumsfeld knows unknown unknowns. We never know it. This year, though, has been funny because there have been so many people talking about Plug X um, going around on USB sticks as a new threat. It's been picked up in the media loads of times. I think at least three security companies have talked about it. You probably can't see the date, but this is us talking about it in 2020, I think, October the 6th. Yeah, Plug X operating out of the recycle bin, not new. What's also not new is subverting authentication systems. So these commands here are from an NGO in the UK back in 2012. And the DLL that was being injected there was a live patch into memory on the domain controllers, which injected a fixed skeleton key password. The password was the name of the domain, an at sign, and something that you could imagine was a code, with code name that the Chinese had given this particular victim. And when the DCs were patched, you could lo log in as any account, any, SA any, any SAM account name, including dom domain admin, and if you just gave this magic password, it just got to that point in the flow and said, you're in. And at the time, this organization used static auth for their VPN, for their extranet, and other things like that. You can see that we published it a couple of years later. Um, sadly, Ben Delpy, Mimikatz, he included a skeleton key mode in Mimikatz 24 hours later. Is the world a safer place or not? Because we published that, discuss, but anyway. Um, and obviously, uh, Tom Brewster wrote it up at Forbes. Um, Actually, that same organization is continually popped by the Chinese. So this is a, an Intel product we wrote um, from them getting hit in October. More recently, in uh, November, December, we handled a super interesting case. And um, you know, I can't say a single thing about the victim, sadly. Um, but if I could, you'd all be like, yes, this is super interesting. But the fascinating thing about it, from a technical perspective, rather than a victim perspective, is what the Chinese did to persist. So they had domain admin, but they wanted to cut a persistent OAuth token in Azure, and they set up their own application to persist, to cut a permanent set of access rights so they could keep reading the, the mailbox from their application. And it's a bit of a mind meld, but an Azure application is basically just, you know, an OAuth token. You don't actually need an application behind it, you just need the OAuth token that you then go and query. So they went to the extent of creating this bespoke, in inverted commas, application and uh, getting a persistent OAuth token for it. What was cool was that they went and read the conditional access policies um, for the organization and worked out, and I won't get the detail here precisely right, but my understanding is they worked out there was some legacy active sync thing left open, you know, the old Microsoft mobile synchronization nonsense, which didn't require multi-factor auth. And they leveraged that to cut a token without triggering Microsoft's adaptive authentication to say, hey, here's, give me a second factor. We've got a couple of Finnish guys, um, uh, uh, Joshua and Nestori. You can find uh, Nestori stuff on aadinternals.com. Um, kind of his claim to fame is that the Russians used his toolkit. But anyway, um, they worked on this. And they were amazed. They couldn't understand why, if someone had already got domain admin credentials, they would go to all of this effort 
just to replicate the same access. And a couple of my guys who've come from UK government sat them down and said, this is all about stealth. This is not all about not being found. This is all about maintaining persistent access in a stealthy way because this target is of interest in an ongoing basis to the, to the Chinese government. And the Russians have been doing this OAuth token thing for ages. So um, we hinted at it in this blog post from ooh, when 2017 um, that the Russians, when they were sending their fishes out, uh, for people who, ha who were on um, uh, Google uh, Apps at the time, I think it was called, whatever it's called these days, G Cloud something. <laughs> Can't be G Cloud, that's government. Anyway, what they were doing was cutting a persistent, permanent OAuth credential when and doing the pass-through authentication, which then allowed them ongoing persistent access to that mailbox. And at the time, even if you changed your password or you implemented multi-factor auth, Google would not uh, nullify that credential. You know, security today is about tokens, not sessions. And of course, that's a really bad segue into just allowing me to put up some of my favorite slides um, about when we were sitting observing the Russians creating Bitly accounts watching them create Bitly accounts all the time, looking at the targeting, saying, yep, this is definitely Russian, probably military intelligence. We captured 19,000 Bitly URLs, 6,500 targeted email accounts. Their pattern of life was 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Moscow time. Donald Trump said it was a 300-pound man in the bed. We saw the Clinton, Hillary for America, and DNC fishes coming through our collect in real time. And in 2016, one of the guys working for me said to me at the start of April, they're not going to create any uh, fishes on one day this month. I think the 15th, if I remember rightly. I said, well, why not? He says, just watch. So the Russians created fishes every day in 2016, apart from the 15th of April. And I'm sure you're all there. What was special about the 15th of April? Was it a public holiday? This is the GRU, Russian Military Intelligence Soldiers. The 15th of April is the day of Radio Electronics Fight Troop in Russia, public holiday. You couldn't get better attribution on who was behind the DNC attack than that. <laughs> we gave our stuff to Thomas Redd, and he used it in his stuff that he did um, when he was talking to the congressman. Anyway, identity is, of course, the new perimeter. How to fix things? Well, this is a Sun Workstation boot screen at Herrick Watt in 1991. I had an unpatched Sun workstation and we had someone coming in as UID equals zero. I learned my lesson, patch or be punished. Um, come back to the ransomware stuff. 50% scan and exploit. Please patch the things that face the internet. 40% credential replay. Please use multi-factor auth completely. And please deal with commodity malware. Thank you very much. And I have no idea we have time for questions.